Good to see you all, everyone, and welcome to another episode of Great People TV with me, Ben Ibrahim. And today we're talking to Matt Friedman, who is the CEO of the Mekong Club. And Matt was on Great People TV on our Chinese New Year episode with his wife, Sylvia, talking about eradicating slavery right here in Asia. But today, Matt's going to talk about his new book, Dancing in the Light of the Moon. But before we talk about the light and the moon in Matt's book, as always, please support us on our social media channel, channel, shall I say, on Instagram, on Facebook, on LinkedIn, on Twitter, and just hashtag Great People TV. So without further ado, welcome back to Great People TV, Matt. Well, it's great to be back again. Great to see you and uh, uh, lots to talk about today. Lots to talk about, exactly, Matt. But Matt, how have you been? All things, I mean, I know you're busy, but how have you been? I'm good. I mean, you know, I can't complain. I mean, I have a roof over my head. I have savings in the bank. I have a wife that loves me and a family and a community that supports me. So I really don't have any complaints compared to the people that I'm uh, kind of addressing in, in the work that I do. Uh, I, I, I have a lot of blessings. And so I, I'm great. That's the great thing about you, Matt. You are super positive 24 seven. And like you said, you know, all the basics in life, all you need is love and security and shelter. But Matt, today we're going to talk about some people who don't have that. So That's right. on that note, tell us about your book, Dancing in the Light of the Moon. Okay, it's a book basically about a family. It starts off in the location of Pune, India. And uh, it, there's four kids, uh, two girls and two boys, and a father and a mother. The father is a lawyer, and he wins a major case against the mafia uh, in Mumbai. And uh, after this big case, he goes home and they're celebrating the entire communities there. And after everybody leaves, this mafia guy and a couple of police come in and actually kill the mother and the father. And they're gonna kill the children as well. And so the nanny sees what's going on, manages to get the kids out the window. She gets the security guard and says, take them to the train station. I'll contact the aunt. Uh, she'll meet you at the train station. You go with them. And so they get out of the building and they make it to their way to the train station, but the security guard chooses not to go along. He's okay. afraid. He's afraid of what's going to happen. So he gets them on the train. The nanny dies before she is able to get the message to the aunt. And so when they arrive there, they're by themselves. So the story is basically their adventures over a 14 year period as four children who don't want to go to the police because they're afraid because they saw what happened to their parents in, in terms of them dying from the police. And so they find themselves in a situation where they get into a forced child labor scenario for a while, and then they escape from that. And then they find themselves in a situation where they link up with a uh, gypsy caravan and they do that for a while. And then they end up working at a school for a while. And then they end up in a forced prostitution situation. And so what I try to do as part of the book is to ingrain you know, scenarios that happen to people related to human trafficking, but to have breaks in between so it's not too overwhelming. You can't write a book like this and just have complete human trafficking because it's too overwhelming. You know, it is it is too much uh, of uh, kind of a negative element to it. So the, the, the book gives you a, a little bit of pain and suffering, and then it gives you some relief, and then a little bit of pain and suffering. But the point is basically to demonstrate what the issue is, how it plays out, how do people react to it, and to do it in such a way as to get to know the characters, to understand their experiences, to feel the pain that they go through, but to also end up with, uh, I'll just say this about the ending, hope, because it's a hopeful ending. Well, hope is a very, very good thing, and that's hope is something that we all need, whether we're going through good times or bad times. But with the book, because a lot of this is part of your work with the Mekong Club, and just to remind our audience about what Matt does, he him he runs a, a company in Hong Kong called the Mekong Club, which helps eradicate slavery and sexual slavery, especially in Asia and Southeast Asia. He's doing a very, very good job. It's an uphill battle, I must admit. And, you know, Matt's had sleepless nights doing this job. And, you know, the things that Matt has seen, it's really, really documentary movie reality stuff coming to the to reality really but matt how many percent of this is fiction and how many percent of this is actually the stuff that you deal with on a day-to-day -day basis in your job as the ceo of the mekong club 
So what I did is I interviewed people over a 10 year period of time, people from Bangladesh, from India, from Nepal, people who were vulnerable to human trafficking, people who had been in sex trafficking, people who had been child trafficking victims. And I probably interviewed over 400 people. As part of that, what I did is I came up with composite characters. So the main protagonist is a girl named Sita. She's the oldest sister. She's the one who basically guides the family. And so she is a composite of a number of different characteristics, but she's based on somebody who I actually met along the way, who I just had admired and respected and, and felt that she was a strong personality. Chandra, Ravi, and uh, Ganesha are the same. They are made up of individuals who I have met who actually told me their stories. So imagine kind of a quilt. A quilt is made up of different pieces that come together in order to create this, this bed uh, sheet uh, that goes over the bed. This story is based on real life experiences that are sewn together to create this mosaic of reality. So. I, I don't have the people's real names and they didn't go through the exact same characteristics, but all of these stories that I have are based on real people. Even the, the, the law situation, the, 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 the murder of the, uh, the lawyer is based on a story that I heard about. Uh, you know, when she comes in contact with the criminals, this was based on real criminals that uh, people were talking about. The, the pimps and the madams were based on actual you know, uh, interviews with these people. So I would say probably 80% of what is in there is based on reality and the rest just ties it together. So it flows. So it's worth reading. Wow. Now, Matt, putting a book together is not easy. It doesn't happen overnight after one week, after one month, there's a process to it. Tell us how long it took you to put this book together from the stories from the publishing, from the marketing to the all the A's to Z's really? Well, when I did my first novel years ago before this one, which was also on human trafficking, that novel took me about a year. And it took so long because chronologically I had to figure out what was happening each step of the way. And I would get to a point where I would stop not knowing what to do. In this particular case, I spent a lot of time kind of figuring out the story in my head even before I wrote it. So I had it in my mind. And so what I could do is the moment I started to write is to write chapter four, and then I'll jump to chapter seven because I get bored with chapter four, and then I go back to chapter three, and then I go to chapter nine. And so as long as you have in your mind what the story is gonna be, then filling in this space really doesn't take that long. You know, so the the, the thinking about it, the planning in your mind, the, the making determinations of how many, characters and so forth was the long part that probably took three months of just sitting and concentrating and, and uh, meditating about this. But the actual writing took about six months. And then I sat on it. I didn't do anything with it for a long time. I got distracted with work and other things, but picked it up again around six months ago and uh, kind of re-edited it, uh, updated it, and then published it uh, just recently. And what's your one tip for people who do aspire to write a book because popular people in any part of the world or successful people in any part of the world are write a book. But what's the first step? Where do you start? What's your tip for them? Uh, having the faith that you can actually write a book. That's the biggest thing. And actually there are three ingredients for writing a book. One is the ability to write, you know, not, you don't have to be a great writer. You just have to be able to write stuff. The second is having something to say, and you see a lot of that in people who want to write books, but they're missing the third ingredient. The third ingredient is the ability to finish something. So I know a lot of people that have amazing first two chapters. When you read it, it's like, oh my gosh, wow, this is great. This is fantastic. But they don't have the wherewithal in order to get the 11 or 12 chapters after that. I just happen to come from a German background and it's all about task orientation. It's all about <laughs> if you say you're going to do something, you're going to do it and you just push through and you push through. So, you know, I, I wouldn't say that I'm the best writer, but I'm a good storyteller and Absolutely. Um, and I can finish things and getting that done. I, I, I There's a book in everybody. Ben, there's a book in you. We've talked about this. Write your book. OK, <laughs> I will. Uh, I will. 
<laughs> the thing to do is to just decide you're going to do it. And just even if it's 15 minutes a day, just jot some things down, edit some things, put some notes, come up with a, 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 a table of contents. Just start doing it. And it, it may take you a year, three years, five years. It doesn't matter. It's a great achievement in a person's life. 100%, 100%. And speaking about finishing, bigger picture, what do you want this book to achieve? Obviously, you want it to contribute to your work, but what are the goals? What are the objectives, short term and long term? It was all about raising awareness. You know, there are some people who benefit from seeing a video. There are some people who benefit from listening to a lecture. But there are a lot of people who learn from storytelling. And the reason for that is the story allows you to kind of project this issue of human trafficking in a scenario of real people going through real life. And we can all relate to that and we can all get emotionally attached to the characters. So helping people to understand the issue, but at the same time, having them have an emotional feeling to this is an essential part of storytelling. And so the, uh, the people who have read this walk away saying, wow, I now get what you're talking about. Uh, human trafficking is complicated. It's got all these factors associated with it, factors that I never would have thought of when I listened to somebody else talk about this. The other thing is raising money. We're selling this and we're taking the proceeds and using them to fight modern slavery. So if you want to do two things that are essential to adding to making the world a better place. One is to read about this and then learn about it and then share the information with others. That's one thing. The second is when you buy the book, you're giving it off to an organization that's going to help to address this issue. Fantastic. Fantastic. And the final question, Matt, it's a bit of a long winded question. And if you give me a super long winded answer, that's a great thing because that's what we're looking for. P paint us a picture here a little bit for those who are a bit unaware of the slavery problem, the sex slavery problem in any part of the world. So that's one picture. Maybe some facts that you can tell us about, two, three points. Doesn't have to be a PhD, just a color point, a couple of points. What is the what are the major three major key problems? And then the other part of that pick that spectrum is that how can your book help? And then the most important thing is, I mean we've spoken about this before, what is what can it potentially lead to in terms of really eradicating this problem because unfortunately it's not a problem that's going to go away anytime soon yeah there are 4.8 million women and girls in forced prostitution what does that mean that means that every day these individuals are forced to sleep with anywhere from 2 to 10 to 20 men and they have no choice about it it's a form of commercialized rape Many of them, if they don't do it, they get beaten, they get tortured, they have food taken away from them. Terrible things can happen to their family. So deaths and threats hold them in place. Uh, every 15 seconds, another person enters into what it is that we're talking about here. So imagine this, imagine a 13, 14 year old girl that you know, imagine if she is in a situation where she has to sleep with these men on a regular basis and imagine if there is no escape from this as long as she's making money and that's what we're talking about with sex trafficking it happens in india it happens in malaysia it happens in hong kong it happens in the united states it happens all over the world and it's a pervasive problem that is, has existed almost forever and so what we're dealing with here is something that a lot of people don't know about they haven't been exposed to this. And when they hear that, what I'm talking about, they're very shocked. And that's exactly what I want people to feel when they read this book is the shocking way in which people get tricked and deceived into a situation where they lose control of their life and they're forced to do things that go against their, their, the grain of their, who they are. It's shameful things, things that make them feel terrible about themselves. And they have to deal with all of these customers, people who are sometimes angry and sometimes aggressive and sometimes abusive, but they still end up having sex with them. You know, and the thing that bothers me so much is that, you know, I've been working on this issue for 30 years. And out of the people who have been in this kind of a situation globally, the 4.8 million, we probably help less than 20,000 of them out of this situation. And the reason for that is that we need human beings 
in India, in Malaysia, in Hong Kong, in Thailand to understand what we're talking about here, that this is a fundamental loss of freedom, a fundamental human right that goes beyond anything that you can possibly imagine. And let me put that into perspective. If you read, pick up your paper and read a, about a rape case, people are, oh my gosh, wow, she was raped. That's a terrible thing. We're talking about commercialized rape. We're talking about these people being forced to do this every day. It's continuous rape. 4.8 million, let's assume the average number of people that they see is five, 4.8 million times uh, five. You know, how many commercialized rapes are we talking about? This is a fundamentally... Uh, 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 abusive problem that just has to go away. So what do I really want to have happen from this? From the work that I do, where I post on LinkedIn, from the uh, presentations that I do in front of all types of audiences, and from writing this book and other books, I'm trying to raise awareness. I'm trying to get people to feel the pain, to experience a certain amount of what it is that happens to these people, but they can do it from the comfort of their home. They're sitting on their couch, they have a cup of coffee, the air conditioning on, and all they have to do is read. But they will get enough of this to start feeling like, wow, you know, this is happening in my country. This is happening to people within my community. This is happening to people who really need this kind of help. And so what I'm hoping to do as part of this with others, I'm not the only one, there's a lot of us out there, is to get a critical mass of people who say enough is enough, something has to be done. Now, in India, um, back around uh, six or seven years ago, there was a sensational rape case. It was a medical student. She was on a bus. She got raped. She eventually died. That captured the attention of the entire country. Everybody was up in arms. There were protests. They changed laws. They changed the way rape cases are, are perceived. And as a result of that, it resulted in some great things. In the counter-trafficking world related to sex trafficking, we need the same type of critical opening up. We need to go viral. We need something to basically sensitize enough people to say enough is enough. This has to change. We as a world can't, will not accept in 2022 a scenario whereby people are forced into this type of situation. And for that to happen, the average person on the street needs to know about this. So read the book. It, it's challenging. It, it has some uncomfortable areas to it. But if you don't read it, you're not going to understand what it is that we're talking about. And then if you do read the book, talk to people or encourage them to read other books or read this book or or go online and look at videos, do whatever it takes. And that's just that's that's my mission is to just kind of continually how, try to raise awareness that this is what needs to be done and um, and to help people to understand they can be part of the solution. Well, Matt, I'm just going to go one step further on your suggestion. Read the book, everybody. And then instead of talking about it, do talk about it. That's the second step. But open your wallet. Open your wallet and donate to a certain fund that can help these kind of people, these 4.8 million women that Matt was, was talking about or is talking about because they need our help. And this is why Matt is working to give these people hope. His passion is so strong. I can feel it from here to Hong Kong, from Timbuktu to Kingdom Come. Matt Freeman, you are a hero and a legend. We wish you all the very best for not just for this book, not just for future books, but hopefully, you know, in your projects that you're doing right now that can really, really help those women. And this problem, inshallah, God willing, as we say in Malaysia, will go away and will be part of history. Nothing more, nothing less. That is the dream. Matt Freeman, thank you so much for your time on Great People TV. You are great. And again, Hit me up on WhatsApp on your next book or any other story you wish to tell because you are a fantastic storyteller indeed. Thank you very much, Matt. Thank you for everything. I appreciate it. Wow, that is Matt Friedman, author of Dancing in the Light of the Moon. Please buy that book and also the CEO of the Mekong Club, the organization based in Hong Kong, which does try to eradicate slavery and sexual slavery, not just in Asia, but in every part of the world. And Matt has been doing it for 30 years. What a great person. And he personifies everything about the individuals that we like to bring on Great People TV who are trying to do great things for the world. On that note, everyone, I'm going to let you all have a fantastic, great night. I'm Ben Ibrahim. And as usual, keep watching Great People TV. And we'll catch you next week. Stay safe.